Welcome to another episode of Reimagining Law. I'm Mark Palmer with the Illinois Supreme Court Commission on Professionalism. Now, if you're like me, during this pandemic, you've attended webinars, you've read articles, seen social media posts, you've even watched videos, videos like these, all about how you can continue to deliver legal services and ensure access to justice. Now, during that journey, a journey that continues, you've likely come across my two guests today, especially from their tiny chats, short form educational videos and discussions about access to justice and court operations across the country, both from the National Center for State Courts, the NCSC. We're excited to welcome Daniel Hirsch and Zach Zarno. Danielle, I want to start with you. Kind of give us the thousand foot view. What does NCSC do and how has its priorities maybe realigned since COVID-19 has happened? So the National Center for State Courts um, is a consortium of all the state Supreme Courts and state court administrators from across the country and territories. And we are the secretariat for both of their big bodies. And I think since the pandemic, we've been providing guidance and working with courts on a very various both research and technical projects for years. But the pandemic has really opened amazing opportunities for how courts can share, but also the need to, in real time, um, understand what different people are trying. So for, in the beginning of April, it was trying to figure out what remote platforms to use and how to use them and what is secure and what are best practices. And so just making the space for curated sharing of what's going on. It's not unlike what's probably happening at a more micro state level in Illinois as different circuits are trying to figure out how to do different things since you're a decentralized state. Um, but the pandemic has been this amazing, I'm a glass half full kind of person. And so for me, the pandemic allows us to think about the opportunities to try things differently because we have this opening. And so um, I've been really interested how technology and the need for technology is driving all sorts of different other kinds of um, problem solving and rule changes and procedures that could have a really long lasting effect. Zach, can you talk about some of the, the specific challenges. I'm sure a lot of our viewers see different aspects of how it's impacted their practice or how they deliver justice. But from your end, um, what you do on the national level, what are some of those specific challenges that state courts have had? Sure. Well, obviously you have to provide services in some ways. So I think remote is probably here to stay in a lot of ways. And that's a pretty dramatic shift for courts, which weren't doing a lot of things remotely. Um, you know, I talked to a lawyer in Southern Illinois the other day who's nearing retirement. And he told me that he spent his whole career driving for hours and hours for 10 minute status hearings. And now they finally let him do them over the phone. Um, another area is online dispute resolution. A lot of jurisdictions were working on this before the pandemic, but many of them have engaged their efforts even more so. Hawaii was working really thoughtfully and they've informed their project um, by thinking about the needs of self-represented litigants. There's safety benefits when you don't have to come to court because you're doing it online, but you also no longer have to travel, take time off work or schedule childcare. And we have a website, the ncsc.org slash pandemic that has a lot of examples and best practices from around the country. Um, and to Danielle's point about technology, the Conference of Chief Justices, Conference of State Court Administrators, released guiding principles for post-pandemic court technology, which I think is really useful as courts think about this. Um, but I, I will close by just saying that, you know, the digital divide is also real. So there are lots of people that don't have access to the internet or they access the internet through a smartphone with limited capabilities or limited data or an internet connection that's unstable or low bandwidth or don't have internet at all. And so there are ways that courts have been overcoming that. Some places they tap federal resources to buy equipment or repurpose computers or rooms to make kiosks for filing or hearings. Um, and some have even partnered with community organizations to, to use um, like mobile hotspots and buses and extending Wi-Fi networks out in the parking lots. There's all sorts of things. So there's a lot of innovation going on and you can see a lot of it on those, uh, the website and the, use those principles when you're thinking about ways to react. Yeah, your mention of both collaboration and innovation makes me think a lot of our viewers are in fact, solo small firm practitioners across the country, especially in Illinois. You know, and a lot of people who watch these videos that we produce and other content, you know, usually they're the leaders in organizations and communities with bar associations locally or state, um, you know, with, with, they're usually teaching in the law schools, they're really involved and they want to know how, how can they collaborate better 
uh, to address these challenges? How can bar associations or other organizations or even the, the law school um, bottom level up um, entities better work as a whole, whether it be on a national level or state level to, to collaborate better to solve these challenges? Well, I'll start. Um... You know, this is, I think, especially in how court processes have changed, courts are figuring this out in real time on their own and having meaningful feedback loops um, through implementation committees and outreach. I just presented actually at a Hawaii bench bar conference that was about how technology is working and how it's not working. And it was really a chance for the bench and the bar to have conversations very practical about how the various dockets are working, how the waiting rooms are working, how to handle multiple Zoom appearances at the same time. So it was a way to collaborate. And I don't know that every bar association and circuit court or um, the state Supreme Court, if they're engaging in that same level of communication. But if I were a member of a local law school clinic or I was in a bar association, I would try to encourage that level of communication with my chief judge of my circuit court to get and get feedback from the bar too. I mean, um, there has to be kind of compassion and understanding on all sides and to make the system work, not only for the bar and the, and the judges, but also for the self-represented litigants who aren't part of those conversations. Um, and so it's just important to have regular feedback because if a particular platform is really challenging, let's just say as an example, it, um, the court won't know about it unless they hear from people in the bar. Yeah, Zach, anything to add? I think the feedback is certainly important and then just collaboration across borders too, whether that be your county border or a state border and really like learning from the other experiences. Um, I think that's the, one of the roles the National Center for State Courts plays, but it's, it's really critical because there's just so much going on. It's hard to keep track of it. And people come up with good ideas and it works really well in their jurisdiction and no one else ever sees it. And that's a shame. Yeah, I really saw that come out in, in especially learning remote options for courts, even here in Illinois, different courts talking to each other. And a lot of that was facilitated via having webinars and about what you're doing in each county. And every county's different, every state's different, um, but you gotta find out what's going on and, and why reinvent the wheel if you don't have to sometimes. Um, I know it's a big loaded question, but I wanna not miss this opportunity to ask people like you who deal with this as your full-time jobs. Zach, how can, how can a court really better adapt to be more responsive to the needs of, of the public they serve when it gets down to the courthouse patrons? First, thanks for giving me the big loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think courts staff work extremely hard and they're often in underfunded systems. Um, but I, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I have some conversations sometimes with people in the court system at all kinds of roles that can be disheartening. And some of that is because I think they talk about self-represented litigants sometimes like they're a problem to solve or an annoyance. And I think we have known for years now, and it's time that courts really acknowledge that in civil case types, all major case types by volume at a minimum, at least one party is self-represented at least 60 to 70% of the time. And in some case types and in some places that's closer to 90%. So I think if you're a court, that is your customer. And many people in the court systems understand this, but there's more that can be done. They can improve um, that responsiveness to the needs of the public, as you say, and embrace that fact. Because then when you think, okay, that is the reality of what we do, it's not you know, extra work to think about plain language or reading levels or process simplification or guiding interviews and self-help resources. Those become like more accurately understood as the things the system needs to do well to serve what is in fact its customer base. And I would just add one thing, which is I, um, I think the pandemic and the remove to certain remote things opens up a lot of possibilities for renewed partnerships pro bono um, representation from across the state as opposed to being limited to what you could drive to the ability to deploy resources you know people don't have to take up work for every single court hearing the idea to re-examine court rules it, it just it um, it's a really wonderful moment to seize all sorts of different opportunities and to expand services. Yeah, to that point, I know, you know Free Legal Answers, which was originally an ABA effort, and you know it's it's kind of been taken over in different formats and different ways 
by each state. And here in Illinois, it's, it's a very active and become a very popular way for attorneys to do pro bono, uh, literally from their, their couch at home. Um, and anytime they can just answer a few questions and, and contribute, um, I hope they continue to do that and it doesn't just become a thing of the pandemic. It becomes a permanent resource to delivering pro bono as one example. I definitely want to get to talking about tiny chat videos. You guys have done a remarkable job uh, delivering this to all different uh, topic areas on justice, on court operations. What have been some of the most well-received tiny chat videos, uh, not to mention all your great props that you guys use? Okay. Um, my favorite one is um, about the principles that Zach referenced, and we rewrote Goodnight Moon to be Goodnight Status Quo, and we got five chief uh, state, Supreme, state Supreme Court justices to read it. Um, that was probably my professional highlight of my life. Yeah. We did one on the difference between legal advice and legal information and put some jokes in there that I wasn't sure we we're going to get past NCSC, but they did and we're still employed. So I'm very proud of that. <laughs> That's but a very... Our whole idea for all those are to really embody like schoolhouse rock, like that you can watch one while you're drinking coffee or taking a break from work and learn something. And I think they're as useful for advocates as court staff. So we encourage your dear viewers to check them out. Absolutely. We will happily share that a link to more tiny chats to come, I hope, uh, just like more reimagining law to come. Um, well, we, we greatly appreciate your time today uh, for joining us and uh, keep up the great work you guys are doing on the national level. And of course, we hope to see you more in Illinois whenever possible. Um, so thank you for joining me. Well, please like and share this video uh, to those who may benefit. Subscribe to the Commission's channel to stay up to date to the newest episodes. Links to the information in the description below. Thank you for watching and be well. Thank you.